But you think to yourself, well, I'll just never step away from managing a culture because that's just too important. And in the last few years, I've realized, no, it's really important that I do step away from that. It's really important that that ownership is transferred from me to the team. This is Lead with Culture. I am Kate Volman, and on this episode, we're talking about strategies to scale a business and building a dynamic culture. I chatted with Ryan Boylston, founder and CEO of Two Ton, a creative agency. He has partnered with companies to assist with marketing and communication strategies since 2011. And prior to launching his West Palm Beach-based agency, Ryan climbed the corporate ladder at AutoNation and JM Family Enterprises, Southeast Toyota. He shared a lot of really great insights and experiences in this episode. So I hope that you enjoy my conversation with Ryan. In your eyes, to you, what is the definition of culture? You know what? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. You and I, you know, joke around about it, that it's not just a cool office with ping pong tables and beanbag chairs. Probably dated myself with a beanbag chair. <laughs> but is that a part of it? The physical environment? Sure, it's a part of it. But culture is so much deeper. And uh, I really think it's about trust and this environment of we're all equals and that we're all working together and that we all have a common goal. And so if you start there and build everything upon that, every time you go, you make a decision on what should that new team member's title be or what should our team event be or, you know, How should we build out our new office? If you always start there, then I think you can continue to build those building blocks of a great great culture. And I learned that I worked at uh, JM Family Enterprises to start my career. And as an organization, I was very familiar with growing up. My mom's worked there for 35 years and they are always ranked as one of the top five companies to work for in the world. And they just instilled a lot of those important pillars of a company culture in me at a very young age. It sounds like you're you're intentional about not only who you're bringing on board, but the culture that you're creating, the environment, even as far as like the titles. I remember you had hired someone, what was their title? Like happy, something happiness? Chief of uh, client happiness. Chief of client happiness. And I mean, it's a title, right? Like what does a title really mean? But the people that are in that role, why is that important? Yeah, I think that's like a perfect example. It wasn't just a fun title or a title that would make people smile. Although, you know, that's, that's certainly a perk when it's chief of client happiness and that starts off with a smile, right? But we were trying to solve a problem in our organization. We were starting to grow. We were probably around 10 team members and I brought on a consultant and that consultant was like, wait a second, Ryan, you have no support as the CEO of this growing company. And uh, you're answering every phone call in every email. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, like, you can't do that anymore. And I go, I know, but here's my issue. I can't bring on an assistant receptionist office manager type role because we're a flat organization and everyone's equal. And I just don't feel like that position will feel like an equal to the creative director. Right. And she's like, great. So we'll make it a chief position. And I go, oh, is it that easy? And she's like, yeah, there'll be a chief position. And I go, okay. And she goes, and what's most important? Like, what, what are you most worried about right now? And I'm like, really, as we're growing, just keeping my clients happy. I want every time they call us on the phone, someone picks up the phone. I never want to send them to an answering machine. I never want to send them to a hit one for this department, right? I just want to keep them happy. She's like, great, chief of client happiness. You're going to go hire one. And you're not going to hire someone at an hourly rate or someone that's been a receptionist or office manager. You are going to go hire the best talent out there at a salary position equal to anybody else in an important position at your company. And their title is going to be chief of client happiness. And it's the best thing I ever did because that position grew into our director of business evolution and we're a team. It's like myself, the CEO of the company and the director of business evolution. We're this little team. So it paid off for sure. And how many people are on your team today? So we have 27 team members today, full-time team members. That's so awesome. And obviously... Leaders talk about the challenge of attracting great talent, keeping great talent. Yeah. So how do yeah. you find your best people? Oh, man, we were so winging it at the beginning. We were just hiring people we know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, really, it was just like, who do I trust in our good people? Oh, my friends and family. So let's start there. And some of them were in the industry and some of them weren't. And we said, we're willing to train. If you're willing to learn, we're willing to train you. 
And then you go, okay, the network's getting a little bit bigger. I'm running out of people I know that we can hire on a team. How about you guys? In the last few years, I think we've gone through our entire network of people. So (laughs) as much as I still like that practice of saying, hey, everybody, we're hiring a new position. Here's the title. Here's the job description. If you know anybody, right, that's who we'd like to interview first, that first phase. And then second, I put it out to a larger network of my colleagues and clients and, you know, chambers and people to really trust because that's what we've, that's what we found. We just need someone that fits our culture, who we can trust and who are self-motivated. My team kind of makes fun of me sometimes. I don't really pay much attention to the resume or the college degrees. Those aren't really the things that are important to me. You know, it's really the type of person you are. And then we can talk about your skill set and how it fits the position. I love that because I think so many organizations when with their hiring process, they're missing that piece of, is it a cultural fit? Are they going to fit with the team? What is that going to do when you bring them on? Obviously we bring on a new team member, especially when you're smaller, right? When you're smaller, that really impacts people, the person's personality, do they get along all of that stuff. So how do you incorporate that into your hiring process to make sure that you're finding the right cultural fit? That's a great question. So at this point, I don't hire anybody. You know, the only position I would probably hire is in the business development, the business evolution department. And in my COO, who has been with me for a really long time, he's my business partner. So I don't hire any of the other positions. So what they do is after putting everyone through an initial screening, which is a lot like what I used to do, is like, hey, before we even get to the interview, let's, let's grab coffee. Let's just grab coffee. Let me tell you about the position and you tell me about what you're looking for. And then take that information and then call me back and then let me know if you want to interview for the position. So they do something kind of like that. And then we have the interview, which may be with, with, you know, one of the heads of our realms or two people. But I think the most important part is that then they'll interview with the team. So you'll actually sit with a group of, you know, four or five people that you're going to be working with. And then they all get to chime in on kind of the vibes that they got from hanging out with that individual for, you know, a 30 or 40 minute period. Was there ever a time that you can remember where it it was kind of like 50, 50, or there was people that were like, yeah, we want to hire this person. And, but they couldn't decide. Actually that happened to us recently. One of the tougher positions to hire for in our company is the project manager, project consultant, because it's just, it's one of those positions you have to have a a lot of skill sets and you're managing, you know, our team on a project, but you're also managing the relationships with the clients. And my team came to me and said, Hey, we're down to two candidates. And we love them both. And one is, you know, really experienced and they're going to come in at this level, which is great. But then there's this other one that's, you know, kind of right out of college, kind of had a job where she's so much potential in her. And I went, great, hire them both. Why not get ahead? Why lose out on one of these individuals? You know, it's always a, a position that is very hard to hire for. So why don't we get ahead of the game here? You know, offer them both the position. They both came on with us. That's how you roll. I feel like you're very, (laughs) you're very good at making those kinds of decisions and seeing the potential in people and in your team. So in Matthew Kelly's book, The Culture Solution, principle number four is hire with rigorous discipline, which is a challenge, right? Especially when you need people. Have you ever made a hiring mistake over your 11 years of growing the business that you can remember that was like the biggest mistake you made? One time I did hire a young kid, definitely a entrepreneur type. He was self-motivated. He has his own little apparel company, own little graphic company. He was a friend of a friend and hired him. And um, there was a wild disconnect between you know, our organization and what he was expecting. You know, he came in with a lot of different skill sets, not highly trained in any of them and felt because he had so many skill sets, because he could pick up a camera or because he could graphic design or because he could do a little code and send this to me that he should be paid highest in the company. And because of the list of things he could do in comparison to his colleagues. Some of his colleagues had been designing and been creative directors longer than he had been alive. And it was that day where I was like, we're going to part ways today. There is definitely a disconnect here. But I got to tell you, if you don't fit here in such a short period of time, then maybe this isn't really for you. Maybe you really should chase that, you know, owning your own agency, right? And like doing your own thing. 
because you kind of had that. And then you came to work for us and it's completely because he agreed. He was like, yeah, this isn't work. And I'm like, okay, great. So we parted ways. He did go and start his own shop, which we would send him work when we had clients that couldn't afford our agency. And as far as I know, that was like six, seven years ago. As far as I know, he's still running a nice little agency. It all worked out. But there is a funny part to that story that I still hear about today is that we parted ways with him on his birthday. So now there's like a running joke in the office still to this day. It's like, oh, it's your birthday. Don't meet with Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love that. Ugh. Well, you know, what's so cool about that, Ryan, is again, it goes back to the culture, right? You approached him very candidly. Hey, this isn't working out. And then he got to go off on his own and you send him business that obviously he's talking good about you and your company, yeah. your organization. And I mean, there's something to be said about that too, because obviously you have the culture that you're building inside and people are talking about that culture. When they yeah, lead yeah. the organization, they're talking about their experience there, what it was like, how it was working with you and the team. And that's a really big deal because every company wants to say they have a great culture, but it's mm -hmm. what's being talked about. How are people experiencing that culture? Yeah. And that's really the phase that we're in now is it's no longer a culture I'm building for the company. It's got to be the culture the company is building for the company. It's the last thing that I got to step away from. Like I... I haven't designed something in a long time. Everybody on my team is a better designer than I. I haven't coded something in a long time because everyone's a better coder than me. And then that last piece, you think to yourself, well, I'll just never step away from managing a culture because that's just too important. And in the last few years, I've realized, no, it's really important that I do step away from that. It's really important that that ownership is transferred from me to the team. And that's why we have Nicole on our team, who's our director of business evolution, used to be our chief of client happiness. She's really taking up like the lead when it comes to evolving our culture. So that's a really good distinction because there's not one person that creates the culture. It grows organically. I mean, yes, there has to be someone that is in charge of it, that's responsible for it, that makes sure that things are getting mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. to create that culture. But as you are growing, you know, you started, you were a small shop starting and now you have 27 people. Over the years, as you have grown, how were you creating that culture? How were you putting culture at the forefront of the decisions that you were making? So at the beginning, we just put some pillars in place. And like I said, I have to give credit to some of the organizations that I had an opportunity to work with before starting my agency and just took bits and pieces. For instance, everyone on our team, we refer to them as team members or associates. Like it, it, we don't use the word employee and the word boss. You know, we had a flat organization. I really wanted everyone to walk in the door and not feel like there's people above them or there's people below them or to elevate in the company. You got to beat that person to this spot. But as you evolve, you do have to make changes. So as we got bigger and we had to have departments, uh, which is one, another one of those words, it's like departments, right? We said, you know what? What are we going to have? Well, we're a creative agency and we got a mixture of Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter fans and Marvel fans, right? I mean, it just comes with the territory. We're all fans of all those different worlds. So we decided, you know what? We're going to have realms, right? That's what we're going to call, it, right? When we finally made that announcement that, hey, I think you've all realized that we can't just be this growing, bloated one organization that we need, that we're already naturally working in our own little realm, right? The social media content creation realm and the digital marketing realm and the design realm. We evolved and we moved to realms. So that's just like one of those examples where, yeah, I set a pillar in the company of like no departments. We're never going to have a department. We're always going to be a flat organization. And then later on you go, you know what? We got to change that. We can't have that. That can't be set in concrete. That's something we got to evolve and we got to rebuild and we got to change it. But we can still ensure that it aligns with the culture that everyone expects when working here. We don't got to change it to something that's not us. Yeah. And what's funny to me when you talk about the office and not having to have the ping pong tables and all that stuff, you actually did create an environment where people feel, I mean, look, you're a creative agency, right? People need to feel inspired when they're doing the work and you created that, that space for them. And it felt very collaborative. It felt like a team. Everyone's there to support each other, to be there for each other. Have you experienced, especially again, as you're hiring new people and bringing them on, what have you seen were some of the challenges with just integrating people, what that looks like, any kind of role challenges of this person does that versus this person does another thing? You know what? I'll say because we do have a pretty like 
rigorous hiring process. You know, that example I gave earlier about hiring someone, like those were red flags that we would catch today, like major disconnects, yeah. right? And my team actually put almost everyone through exercises. So we really try to do as much due diligence as possible. Like if you're coming on as a developer, you'll have to, we'll give you some coding exercises to make sure like you can handle the work that we're going to give you. If you're coming on as a project manager, we're going to give you some examples. What if a client says this to you in an email? What's going to be your reply? So with all that process in place, you know, knock on wood, like we're pretty lucky when we bring people on and it's going to be a fit. And I would say, if it's not, it jumps out pretty quickly because it's like, we're such a well-oiled machine and so supportive of each other. And, you know, we've done a really good job of keeping that, like, that negative office clicky environment outside of our walls of our company, which I know I'm sure you've experienced in organizations. I've experienced in organizations. Mm -hmm. We're pretty lucky. There hasn't been too many examples like that. You talked a little bit about with that particular individual, there was kind of a an expectations gap. There's a lot of that happening in organizations because people aren't really clear what their role is, what they need to be doing, mm-hmm. and really what winning looks like. What are some processes that you've put in place so that everyone on your team feels like, hey, I'm part of this team, I'm part of this mission, and I get to do what I do best. So how do you put processes in place for those people to feel like, hey, I know that I'm doing a great job. I know that when Ryan comes in my office, I'm not getting fired on my birthday. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I really like having conversations with people about where they want to take their career. I had a uh, a great head of my department at one of these companies, and he said to everybody in the room that worked under him, I'm here to build your resume. And if that resume keeps you with this company forever, great. And I hope that's the case because I've had a great career here. But if it doesn't, then it doesn't. If, you know, if I can't give you what you want in your career, that's going to fulfill you, well, I'm going to help you get there, whether it's here or not. I thought, man, that's really neat that he just said that. Like, hmm, I wonder if uh, his bosses know he's saying that. It was like really refreshing. So I have that same conversation. I sit down and I go, where do you want to go with your career? What do you want to do? What do you like? And if they go, I really like making, you know, videos. That's my thing. Like, I know I came on as a graphic designer, but well, guess what? We need video. So Let's just start transitioning you into that. Our previous chief of client happiness, fantastic in the role, said, you know what, Ryan, this isn't what I want to do. You know, I came on because I wanted to work here. And that was the position available and my skill set fit it. She's like, I want to be a graphic designer. I want to work in social media. I want to do content creation. You don't really have a lot of experience in that area. But if you're willing to take kind of a step back and learn and join the team, we'll make it happen. But I was straightforward. I'm like, you're on this trajectory right now as a chief of client happiness. You're doing an amazing job. And she's like, yeah, it's just not what I want to do though. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, cool. So let's kind of hit the reset button a little bit and let's start getting you working with that team, right? Shadowing in that team. And then little by little, she left the position and she moved on to a new position. She's still with us today. See, yeah, that's yeah. What's so great when you create that kind of culture where you feel like you can actually have that conversation. Most people would feel like they wouldn't be able to come up to you and have that conversation in fear that you would just let them go. But the fact that you gave her this opportunity, I mean, she's still with you today, so I'm assuming she's doing a good job. So she built this <laughs> whole other skill set, being able to kind of learn as she was growing. And that's what leaders are here to do, right? We're here to help people grow. Yeah, exactly. And we've had examples where we've had developers that are like, hey, my goal is to be a software developer. And you go, we're not going to develop software. That's something we're never going to do. So I'm going to try to find as many projects as possible close to software, but we're really sticking the web development realm. But we have, you know, jumped into app development and help you build your resume, right, in your portfolio. And then one day when you get that opportunity, we're all going to celebrate when you go and, and, and join that software company. And that's happened. Wow. That's so cool. I love hearing you talk about this stuff because you're a really wonderful leader in all areas of your life. And just watching you build and grow the business has been cool because obviously there's a lot of challenges in being an entrepreneur in in running a successful business. As you've been growing and building, what have been some of the biggest hurdles, the biggest challenges that you've dealt with? One recently was uh, we've always been really great at the team activities for fun and team building. Like, you know, from day one, we've always been about having fun, going out, creative ideas. The bus comes and picks us up and takes us go-kart, right? Say, are we going to drive shaft and hit golf balls or whatever? We've done so many fun things together. It's been great. But recently, my team has been like, what about professional development? 
can we incorporate more of that into these team days? And that was like daunting to me because, you know, I'm thinking back and um, they're real hit or miss in my professional career where they're like, you know, we're going to have a company workshop day and we're bringing in speakers to do extras and everyone at the same time rolls. Oh my God. Like, you know, like, <laughs> oh God. And they weren't all horrible, right? They're 50, 50, I'd say. Right. So I was quite nervous, but, you know, luckily Nicole, who had joined our team, she has a background in education and she actually has her master's and she came to us from the world of education. And I was like, what do you think about doing our first company summit? A one day summit, we kick it off, we bring a speaker, we do a lot of team exercises and we have some breakouts with the rounds and people present back to each other and we brought in Anthony Francis from Improv U. He uses some of the techniques in improv for professional development. So we just did that to kick off the year. And I'm like getting goosebumps thinking about it. It was such a success. It was great. But I just felt it was so daunting to like really make a professional development day. That was going to be great. That wasn't going to be a drag. That everyone was going to be super excited about all day long. And they were. And they're like, when are we doing it again? And can we keep doing it? So now we have like, Nicole's putting together these monthly, like kind of lunch and learns, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we're bringing in speakers or we're letting other people teach classes. So we're going to keep it going throughout the year. And then we're even going to do a bigger summit, maybe a day and a half, two day summit um, to kick off 2024. So uh, that was one of the bigger challenges. Of our I know how to have fun and do team activities, but how do I work <laughs> in professional development without ruining the fun and still staying engaging? And we totally just did it. And it was absolutely fantastic. I'll say one of the biggest challenges that I haven't found necessarily a solution for, as you know, I'm the CEO over at Two-Ton. So I have a lot of flexibility with that organization. Uh, we want to implement something, we can implement something. But my other job is that I'm a city commissioner in the city of Delray Beach, which is an elected position. I'm not the CEO, right? I'm a board and we have a city manager who acts as the CEO of the company. And it's a large organization, all right? It's a thousand employees. It's a $160 million budget. And man, trying to shift the culture there is really challenging. One, I'm not in the position. I'm not in the CEO position. You know, I got a little speedboat at two ton. This is a cruise ship. So when you want to turn it, <laughs> you know, it takes a little bit more power, a little bit more time. So five years, you know, as a city commissioner in Delray, a lot of hurdles of evolving a culture in government. It's a big difference. Oh my gosh, that is definitely a challenge in those types of roles. But it's awesome that people want to be in those roles to to push forward a little bit. I mean, you've made progress over, has it been five years already? I can't believe that. Yes, and I have a, a, an incredible amount of patience now because of those five years. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> you always learn something from uh, <laughs> from new roles. What do you think the biggest mistakes are that leaders are making? You know what? I would say right now, well, one, the whole old model of being a boss and the way people are still talked to today or that like I'm above you and you're below me, that whole culture is still out there in a lot of industries. I know it's crazy, you know, for you or me who both work with incredible organizations and you and I might be like kind of in this bubble where we're like, that still exists. It still exists. And it's out there and it needs to be like annihilated and changed and, and erased. But more of like a modern issue that, that I see out there is the whole debate on do I need an office? And coming out of the pandemic, you've seen companies get rid of offices and go, hey, we're never going to have an office again. And then you've seen large corporations go, hey, you don't have to ever come in to work again. And then that same organization said, Everybody must come back to work now. <laughs> what we have found is the hybrid approach because we've built a culture of trust, right? And it was proven to us over the pandemic where we didn't have to worry. We had the systems in place and the, in, in the culture in place that we didn't have to worry about whether or not someone was doing their job because they weren't coming into the office. It shifted our thinking. However, we didn't just go, cool, now we can save money, get rid of the office. Instead, actually, we... We expanded our office and we did that in a way so that we have this collaborative space where we can invite people in our space. We can make sure that clients are you know, welcome in our space, that we can have team meetings in that space, that we can have the right type of technology. So for our team members or clients that are remote and can't be there, they could feel like they're there. 
And it's just been a real big differentiator because one, I think our clients, they go, oh, good. You still have an office. Like they want their agency to still have an office, right? To still have this presence. But then also team members. I'm not forcing anybody to come into work. We're office optional. But isn't it nice to have that option? We had one team member. She joined an agency, I think pretty much right out of college. And the pandemic hit. She then worked in her bedroom for a year and a half. And the pandemic opened up and the agency announced, we've sold the office. We're never going back. And she was like, oh, I'm done. She's like, I'm done. Wow. So the very first question she asked, the very first question she asked in the interview was, do you have an office? And I was like, <laughs> yes. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. Right. And it's nice. We go into the office and some days it's me and, you know, one or two other team members. And then sometimes I come in and I go, oh my God, everybody's here today. Like, what's the deal? And it's like, oh, we all were like, hey, we missed each other. So we said, hey, let's all come in on a Friday and we're all going to play a game at, you know, five o'clock. We're going to do trivia and then hang out afterwards. And I'm like, oh, cool. cool. Like, I didn't organize that. I didn't have to organize yeah. that. I actually just read this article in the Harvard Business Review and it was talking exactly about this. Like, what's better? Do you go back to the office? Do you not? And basically the essence of the article talked about how it's less about do we need to be physical or work from home? It's about the intentionality of the culture that you're building. How intentional are you about what you're creating? Do people feel connected to the to mission, the vision? Do they know what is expected of them? Like all of those pieces that is what incorporates mm -hmm. culture. Those are the things that we have to be caring about. And then when you hear stories like that, when your team is going out and doing things together, that's awesome, right? Like you don't even have to facilitate that. It just organically will start to happen because you're building that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. My team's the same way. I was like, I want you guys to feel safe and comfortable. So you let me know if you want us to work from home, it's cool. And they were all like, get us back together and in the office, there's energy. They love it. Knowing that they can go into the office or not. And we have to remember too, when you're running a business, there are people in your company, you don't know, do they have an office? Is there a lot going on in their home? Do they have mm -hmm. a space? If you're living in a really small place and this, this girl was working out of her bedroom, how much fun can yeah. that be every day to just be living, working, sleeping, everything in one room? Right. So to be able to have that option is great. So, and but that's right. cool. You make, you make a good point. You don't know everybody's different situation or how far they have to live. What's their commute inside? You don't know. I'm sitting in my living room right now. My laptop is on a ironing board. So you know, I don't have it. I don't have an office. As soon as I get off this call with you, Kate, I run, I'm running into the office where I actually have a desk. But you're right. And it really does give everybody flexibility. You know, like you mentioned, we're in South Florida and, uh, you know, the affordability of rent and homes. And if you're able to go 30 or 40, five minutes outside of, you know, the core where our offices are both located, it gets more affordable, right? But man, if you have to spend an hour and a half, two hours in a car every single day, because you're forced to go into the office for really no real reason. So it's given some flexibility for my team members to open up where they live. We've even had some team members that have come to us and said, Hey, Ryan, I have an opportunity. It's been my dream to just live in New York for one year. And I have this opportunity. I got a roommate and like, I could do it. But I don't want to leave the company. I look, I could yeah, go, go. We have one team member that's in New York for a year right now. And then we have another one that had an opportunity to go to the UK for three months. Go, go, you know, but these are incredible experiences and I want you to have them. And we've put a culture and a system in place that, you know, allows that to happen. I mean, think about the trust. I mean, that person's going to stay with you, right? Like, you're not going to leave an organization that says, hey, go do the things that you want to do and you still get to work with us. You still get to be part of the team. You still get to do your great work that you love doing. That is so cool. There's a company called Remote Year. Have you heard of this? That This is what they do. They basically like is plan all of these trips all over the world. You're in a group of people that are all wanting to I work have. remotely from a different country and you get to do it with a group. What, an, yeah. what, what a phenomenal experience. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's different for everybody, right? So everybody has different roles and expectations. One thing that we did have to do is we had to go through, you know, all the positions kind of retroactively and go, here are the roles that have to live here uh, because you are going to have to step in front of a client physically. You are going to have to present 
to a board in a physical environment, right? So we went through and said, here are the positions that we believe have to be here, right? There's no way for you to go capture video content, you know, at one of our clients' offices or one of the restaurants if you don't live here. And then we said, and here are the ones that have a little bit more flexibility than the other ones. And you just now, when you apply for a position at Tuton, we say that. We let you know right off the bat that yes, everybody's office optional, but this position has to live regional and this one is a little bit more flexible. It's about expectations. I love it. Expectations. I yeah. love it. Yeah. What is the mission of Two Ton? What is your mission? Oh man, you know what? It's such an odd time to ask us that because we're going through right now a complete rebranding and rethinking of the agency. And that's a question that we're having, but it. You know, I think it's really just to serve not only our clients, but our industry and our community with creativity and passion. I mean, that's, you know, that's the root of our mission and what we're looking to do. So what piece of advice would you give to a leader who right now is growing? They are bringing on new people and they feel like maybe they're having a little bit of a challenge with keeping that culture going, moving, mm -hmm. flowing. And, yeah. uh, and again, being really intentional about that. So whatever pillars that you put in place at the very beginning, like those things that are just not going to change, you know, what, like one for us was, I'm not going to use contractors. I'm not going to outsource. That's something that we've kept in place and I'm not going to pay anyone hourly. Okay. So when you say that, man, you've just made a commitment that is definitely going to slow your growth, right? Because everyone you bring on, you're going to bring on a salary team member. You're not going to outsource. You're making this commitment in many times I would challenge with that going, man, if you just outsource that, you can make more money. If you just outsource that, it could happen quicker. You could grow, you could scale faster, but that wasn't the organization that I wanted to build. And, you know, I got into this entrepreneur world because I wanted to start my own company, but I stayed in it because I like creating jobs. That's what I like doing. That's my job now. I think it's just creating more positions, right? The more successful the company is, the more people we can bring on and we can support and not just support from financial standpoint, but give them a work-life balance that I think is pretty awesome. So I would say just stick to your guns. That's probably the most important thing because there's going to be so many pressures that push you to give up those things, to give up those pillars and don't do it. It's not worth it. What's your superpower that you feel like is really what you are best at? And maybe it's something that you weren't so great at before, but you feel like, yeah, this is my superpower. I am exactly where I'm supposed to be completely winging podcast interviews, like just not even, <laughs> not even, not even preparing for them. Just literally going from ironing my shirt on this ironing board to putting my laptop on and jumping on with you. That's probably my superpower. Really, <laughs> I've really honed that skill. You know what? I guess I really just trust people. I think that's it. I don't need to hold on to power. I don't need to be the decision maker. I'm okay when someone fails, when we do hire a person that I did not talk to or review the resume or anything, and it doesn't work out, it just was this big, it just doesn't work out. I can go, yeah, that happened to me too. You know, I made that mistake too. Let me take a look at all the processes we have in place. I don't think there's anything you could have done better. It's okay. It's cool. Let's go find the right person. And recently, leadership at Tuton just took this test. I think it's an IP test or PI test. And it's, you probably know about it. You answer a bunch of questions and it tells you like, you know, where you scale in all these different areas. And now our whole team's going to take it next month for our lunch and learn. And <laughs> one of the areas is flexibility. And mine was so high that the flexibility dot was covering the word flexibility, which is like <laughs> off, literally off the chart. And my team thought that was so funny. And they're like, that's you to a T is that, you know, I'm just like, I'm just rocking and rolling and just like trusting everybody and being super flexible with everything. And when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It's okay. You know, we'll fix it. Thank you for listening to this episode. I really love how intentional Ryan is about his leadership style and growing his business and his team. I hope that there was at least one idea from today's conversation that sparked your interest enough to take action. It really is important to us that you get value out of every episode that you listen to and actually do something with the information, right? It's so easy for us to just listen to a podcast or go to a conference or maybe talk to a friend 
end and we learn these new strategies or gain these new insights, we don't do anything with them. But we want this to be a show that encourages you to take action. And when you do, we would love to hear about it. So connect with me over on LinkedIn and let me know what you like best about the show. And if you're interested in developing your people and you're serious about becoming the best version of yourself this year, we would love to chat with you about coaching. To learn more, go to floydcoaching.com. And until next time, lead with culture.